and good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about victory language. Victory language. I mean, as a Christian, shouldn't that be our language? Victory language. It may seem that the world is awfully big and it may seem that the world is awfully dark. And sometimes we may speak in more of like, I'm just getting by language or man, I feel really beat down language. Or it seems that so many people are rising up against us language, but we're Christians. Our language should be victory language. And I thought tonight might be a night that we get a bit of encouragement and see a little bit of hope and and maybe focus on the very, very good things we have as Christians that sometimes we find easy to forget, but we're Christians. Our life is in Jesus. First Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50, Paul's going to talk about victory, the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. He says, now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Man, that's some encouraging words to hear. Victory in Jesus. That's what defines our lives as Christians. Victory, a celebration. I love those moments of celebration. They come up sometimes in so many things that we do in the world. I remember in high school, I did not play on the basketball team nor the baseball team. I was on the math team. And and listen, don't you laugh. Don't you laugh. We didn't have the same kind of life as the basketball team. We didn't have cheerleaders. But our county was very, very supportive, and they did buy us V-neck sweaters, uh, which was very cool. All the chicks dug it. We did have nylon jackets that the judge executive bought for us because they were very supportive of us. The neat thing about it, though, is that we got along, being at a small school, we got along very well with the basketball team. We were all friends. And they would sometimes pull us out at pep rallies and play us against each other and whatnot. It was a good time. It was a good thing to do. But one thing we did share very much in common besides our friendship and our hometown and those sort of things, man, when we won, we celebrated. I mean, we celebrated together. And there were moments when the basketball team would win. And even if it was just a game against our rivals, Wolf County, man, we would celebrate with them and cheer and scream. And even if they just won district or whatever, we would go all out. And you would think, you would think we had won the national championship. But we loved our school and, you know, our friends. And this was a big deal. So we're going to celebrate. But even on the math team, which matters, thank you, we would celebrate, man. It was the best. And that's one thing we had in common with them. I remember after some tournaments that we weren't expected to win, we would get on the bus and we were singing and yelling and literally diving over the seats on the bus and our coaches were cheering as well. It was a celebration because you're so passionate about what you're doing. You're so passionate about it. You've got to celebrate those moments. And when we lost, we'd mourn and take it pretty heavy as well. You got to have those both sides of that because you care deeply about it. But the victories matter. The victories matter. That's a thing we even understand when we're little. Last week, about this time, there was a young man up here who was playing on the stage. Raiden, this is you, buddy. And Raiden was edging around the front of the the pulpit. And I thought, man, that's a kid that wants adventure. But he was kind of hesitant here at the edge because those of you at home, you may not be able to see it, but it's only about four inches, right? And I guess if you are a young lad, that's not very much space. But in my mind, I was like, this is just like being that moment in Indiana Jones, which you're going at the edge of the cliff. And maybe he's picturing that he's 200 feet up. I don't know. But he would look at me and he'd be like, I don't know. And I was like, you can do it, buddy. You can do it. And so I came up here and tried to show him how to edge across. And I know his, his mama was in the room. There was a witness to this. This was not without 
at least observation. He could have fallen for sure. And he could have caught the edge of a table. And I could go in all the miserable things that could happen, but I won't because he's young. But when he edged across and as I held his arm, he got to the other side and he just looked at me and, yes, yes, victory. And then he said the great victorious thing, let's do it again. Of course, man, of course we'll do it again. And eventually we'll get to where he's not holding my hand as he does that because victory. We forget that sometimes in Christianity, don't we? We're God's people. The victory's already been done for us. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered sin. That's our victory. The thing that very much defines our life, our day-to-day life, this isn't just some strange esoteric thing that we keep in the background, but no, it's in the forefront of who we are. A new creature, a new creation in victory because Jesus rose again. Because it's real. Christianity is real. And when you look into those moments in the Bible and you can see sometimes they're worried about what's going to happen in the world and it seems so big to them as well, didn't it? The power and might of Rome crashing down and trying to force them to live a particular way or accept Caesar as God and acknowledge him. Or the, the other religious leaders at the time, which should have been pointing towards God, but they were, they were coming down pretty hard in opposition to the Christians, and it would have been easy to feel like we have no hope. The entire world is against us, but what I hope they remembered was these words of Jesus and what they would see in in his followers. And you probably know this verse off the top of your head. It's a really good one to memorize, to go back to. This is Jesus talking to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. That's victory language. In the world, you will have tribulation. That wasn't a maybe. That was a certainty. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Wow. Do you remember that? Is that a thing you hold on to? When that tribulation does come towards you, is that a thing you grab a hold of? Or do you let the tidal wave of darkness in the world drown that out and we forget it? And we know it's there, but we've got to do a very, very good job of pulling that to the forefront. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. You, you, we, we are his people, the one who has overcome, the one in whom we have victory. Why would we pull back? Why would we hesitate? Why would we not go forth, not out of pride or arrogance, but in the strength and the confidence in our Lord Jesus, glorifying him? That's the life that we have, the greatest thing we could possibly have. I would encourage us to describe that in victory language. Let me ask you this. Do you have a victory attitude in your life? When you go out into the world, do you say, yeah, I'm God's people. I'm God's people. I'm part of God's church. And when I go out into the world, I don't do it out of fear and I don't do it out of regret. I don't do it out of concern and I don't do it because, you know, we're so small as Christians. No, no. I go out representing God and I want the world to see him and I want the world to know him and the, and the love that he has and the mercy that he gives. And so that they can see hope and victory as well, not for my own sake, but for his Not for my own pride, but so that people would know him. Do they see victory in our lives? Do we let it come out of us? Here's some ways that we might think about that. Have you ever allowed yourself to appreciate the victory you have in overcoming temptations? I know some people, they face temptations on a regular basis, and man, they they eat at them. Some temptations are harder than others. There's some that you might be struggling with that I may never struggle with, and vice versa. There's some I may struggle with that you might not have to deal with. And there's plenty that we'll all share together. They're just common to mankind. Sometimes there's a tendency of people to beat themselves down because of the temptations. And they say, man, I'm tempted yet again. I'm failing. I'm just failing. And they don't give themselves the space to say, when I have beat that temptation, when I did not give in to it, when I said yes to what God wanted instead of yes to what the world wanted, They don't ever celebrate that as a victory. 
Now that may seem like a very, very small thing and it's significant, we just blow it past it, but sometimes I wonder, do we give ourselves the space to celebrate those victories in our temptations? I am grateful for every temptation that you overcome because it solidifies you as God's people. It's worth celebrating and recognize the victory that you choose God in every single moment, even in the midst of temptations that might grind at you a little bit. We got to celebrate that because it's a win. We're doing it to glorify God because that is the right kind of life and let us stand firmly in it and let us celebrate those for one another. Do you give yourself space to celebrate the victories when great difficulties come our way? Do you have the attitude of victory that, you know what, no matter how big the difficulty is, we're going to come together as God's people and we're going to drive right through it towards God, not tearing at one another, not looking at ways to pull each other apart, not ways to chase how it could all go south and turn upside down on itself, but how do we move towards God? And in that is victory. In Acts chapter 15, there was a great turmoil. You can imagine how difficult this would have been. I mean, already the idea that, you know, the Jewish people were the first people that became Christians, the, the first converts in Acts chapter 2. And Jesus had mentioned that there was going to be others that would too, that this would spread to the world, but that's a lot to process. When the history of your people had been so much uh, dr driven towards the fact that it's just you as a special people, and, and truly they were, they had a special covenant with God wouldn't go near the Gentiles. It wouldn't touch the Gentiles. There was an idea of staying separate and that even extended to the Samaritans as well. And yet by the time we get to Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans are becoming Christians. It's a massive rethinking of your worldview entirely. Many Christians accepted it. Some struggled. Acts chapter 10, Gentiles start becoming Christians. Many Christians accepted it, but in some were like, whoa. It's just seven to eight years, but a lot of changes are unfolding. And so by Acts chapter 15, some, some were wondering what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, saying, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Some difficulties were coming. There was an idea of us Christians versus them Christians. Pretty divisive. It may be hard for us to picture that in some ways, but we've experienced somehow the, the idea of other. They are other. You may have even felt like other in the church at some point. This isn't God's way. It certainly wasn't here. And so the, the Christians, the leaders, they came together to discuss it. And this is a very, very difficult thing that, you know, didn't fit God's plan, that kind of teaching. And it could have shattered a lot of people's hopes and, and their idea of what was on the horizon for the kingdom of God. But the leaders who had a mindset and the Christians who had a mindset, you know what? Our victory's in Christ. Let's do what Jesus says. The leaders that said, you know, I get that there's strong opinions over here, but sometimes your strong opinions, your feelings, they need to shift because what's more important than feelings is truth. And God's truth has got to be what we, we lean into. So they came together and worked it out. And and they wrote a decree and they communicated that to the people around them. And I love the language that's used, the victory language that's used, because when they, when they sent that letter out, when they delivered it, the conclusion that, of course, Gentiles can be Christians. And of course, they don't have to keep the law because we're now under the law of Christ. There was rejoicing. Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. They overcame in a way that pleased God. Not to tear each other apart, but to build together. That a victory attitude. Man, any, any situation that comes our way, that's gotta be the thing that we do first. Yeah, we acknowledge there's some difficulties and tribulations, Jesus said there would be. But when we do come up against those, what if we begin with the victory attitude? How does this please Jesus? How do we look for God's wisdom? How do the, at the end of this, when we go straight through this, how does the conclusion of this lead to victory, proclaiming the will of God and upholding his character and upholding his quality? And how do we let others see that so that he might be glorified? That's a powerful thing to bring up and to ask ourselves.
Consider other things as well. When you build new godly habits, do you celebrate that in victory? It's okay to do that. It's okay to even share that with one another. Hey, listen, I've really been struggling with Bible study. We may say to ourselves, and I've skipped it for weeks, and then I've come back to it and whatever, but I've been really determined to do it every single day. This week, I did it every single day. Man, we should celebrate that. We should really celebrate those kind of victories. Even the bigger ones, like this is the fifth year in a row I've read my Bible all the way through. Celebrate that. That's not bragging. Don't do it for bragging, but to celebrate the things that we're doing right and doing well and getting better at. We need a celebration mentality in that. When you find new friends in the church, that's a victory. When you learn something new and it builds your faith, that's a victory. When you overcome your fears that hold you back sometimes, that cause you to be hesitant, you overcome, that's a victory. Celebrate those things. When you do right, when it's much easier to do wrong, celebrate that victory because it glorifies God. Tonight, the final thing I want you to think about in victory and the big picture sense of victory is, if you notice how many of these songs focus on heaven, heaven is victory. And if you're a Christian, if you've decided to become a Christian, you are faithful to God, that's a certainty. You are a new creature, a new creation, made for going to heaven to be with God. That's what God wants. Celebrate that victory. Celebrate it to the point that you're willing to tell other people about heaven, about Jesus, that you're willing to share how excited you are for that and how your life is built on and finds meaning in the fact that you are going to heaven, not because you deserve to, but because God made it possible, not because you are so righteous, but because he is. We choose to be faithful. Celebrate those victories. There's so many of the scriptures that we can go to that just keep repeating this over and over again. Even the very, very big stories. David fighting Goliath. There's a reason that story resonates for generation and generation and generation. It's celebrating victory. Anytime the children of Israel came, overcame impossible odds, celebrating victory. When God would give them the victory, it was worth celebrating. The same is true for us today. Please consider your attitude for victory and be willing to celebrate it. Please consider your victory language. The world needs to hear it. They really do. There's a lot of dark things and sometimes it's all people see. And when they come to churches, that's not what we want them to see. We need them to see the victory because it's real. Jesus is real. Salvation is real. A new life is real. Heaven is real. Celebrate those victories. Tonight, if there's any way that we can help you in, in that, I hope you let us know. I hope you have a desire to be a Christian if you are not yet a Christian. And I say not yet, but with every breath that you have, you have an opportunity to make the choice to be a Christian. Don't take that lightly. If it's right, do it. If you've put it off, Ask yourself, why? Why am I putting it off? Come to an answer. And if you don't have an answer, please come ask. And we'll discuss that answer. We'll look for it together because that's what God would want us to do, to find a victory in him. And man, I tell you, we'll celebrate. A new brother, a new sister in Christ, we will celebrate. That's a victory. Tonight, if you've walked away from the church and you need to come back, please come back. Let that be a victory. We choose some of these victories. God just makes them possible. And tonight, if you choose to walk down and, 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 and come to whatever need that you have and help us, uh, have us help you in that regard, please recognize that's a victory that you choose, that you choose. If there's a way we can help you, come forward as we stand and as we sing.